priests of the Israelites after they left Egypt. Now that was that was qualified. Oh, no, no, he was Aaron. Aaron. He was the first one to be given that order of priesthood. And Eli becomes the priest out of he was actually the, uh, the son of uh, Aaron's fourth son. And so he became a priest. Now we know Eli because of the story of Hannah. But, you know, I'm just like everybody else. Eli was just a passing name. You know, we had to focus on Hannah because Hannah is going to give birth to, in my opinion, the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, which was Samuel, right? Uh, he had the highest call in the land. That is the highest call in the land. The name of Eli actually means God is high. And uh, that is something that even in the Old Testament, it carries over to the New and carries over to this day. There is no higher calling in the world than being a, or in the planet or in the universe, than being a priest of God. And that's what he was. Um, unfortunately, his life and his priesthood is not going to end very well. As I was studying this, it talked about the tragedy that came into his life. And there is a good parallel about this. You do know that governors have issued three states and said evacuate the coast because if you don't evacuate, peril could come upon you. So in that sense, if anything happens, and there will be, there will be those 911 calls and people in the water calls that happen in every storm. But the sad thing about it is those tragedies could be avoided if people would heed good advice, right? Now, we ought to take that to the bank, every one of us, including Walt, that tragedies can be avoided if we would heed good advice. And if Eli would have heeded good advice, it would have a better outcome. But unfortunately, he didn't do that, and I'm going to look in just a minute at why. But uh, with all that said and done, there is something good that does come out. And that is because after the death of Eli and his two sons, Samuel is born. And Samuel becomes the icon of what I would say was a righteous man of God. You can't find any sin, any badness connected to the life of Samuel in the Bible. I challenge you to try. He was just gold as far as serving God. And of course you know that he was the son of Hannah. And he was given back to God, and he became that one, not a priest, but a prophet who had that high call. call okay? So anyway, first of all, we're going to look at his failure as a prophet. There's three things that led to his failure. Okay? First of all, he had no spiritual vision. Now, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, I think it's 29, 29, where there is no vision, the people perish. That was true then, and it's true then. If anybody ought to have a vision, it ought to be the people of God, right? Now, here's, here's the clincher. God does call preachers today to a higher calling. But we're all on the same level as having access to God. So that means that God can speak to you just as good as he can to me. And so you can't point always to the preacher and say, well, if the preacher would have had a vision, people would have perished. Our neighbors, our loved ones perish because we don't have a vision of reaching them for the Lord, okay? And so he had no spiritual vision. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 right quick. Chapter 3, we're not going to read but a few verses in each chapter, okay? No spiritual vision, okay? Chapter 3, 1 and 2. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before he lied. And the word, of the, Lord, the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Now, not only had he lost his vision physically, but he also had lost his vision spiritually. You could almost use that epitaph for a lot of churches today. There are churches that at one time were tremendous works of God, did great things. But as they got older, their eyes waxed dim and they could not see. They had no vision doing things for God. 
They got spiritually satisfied of sitting on the pew waiting on Jesus to come or, or waiting on the undertaker to show up, one of the two. But no spiritual vision, and that was just a kind of an icon there of, uh, or a, I don't know what you can call it, a phrase where it speaks of his lack of vision because his eyes were deep. Friend, let me tell you something. You may know this, you may not. But do you understand that Christianity is failing today? It really is. The three major religions of the world, Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism, okay, is pushing Christianity to the back. Okay? Just 20 years ago, 25% of the world's population, not just America, claimed to be born again believers. Okay? You know what that percentage is today? 8%. From 25% to 8%. Okay? Now, why does that happen? Why have we lost our vision? It's real simple. Christians have become comfortable. That's it. Lounge chair religion. We like the padded pews. We like the air condition. I know you don't like it as cold. You like the air condition. You like the heat. And if things are out of whack, we don't play ball. We just say, I'll go somewhere else. So we like comfort. Secondly, we like safety. And thirdly, we like entertainment. Simple point. Now, so if preachers are going to do the repentance thing and, you know, get hot and heavy and say that, Get in the altars and get right with God. No, 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 no. Okay, so we've lost our vision. We understand that we are supposed to be a place where souls are one to one. Okay? And if Christians are not busy reaching others with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we have no purpose. At times, I promise you, when this church was created, all churches basically was created to have vision. We want community to grow to Christ. We want to win the community to Christ. We want our church to grow. We want to see people born again in one. But somewhere along the line, we got comfortable with dust in the baptistry. We got satisfied because we felt safe here. You know, we're among believers. We're pews are nice and comfortable. The only thing missing is this is coming with the next generation. We're going to have to start putting seatbelts in the pews. So when those people fall, you know, to sleep, they won't hurt themselves. That's coming. And then we replace the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ with being entertained. I mean, let's have entertaining music. Yeah, boy, that's what will draw people, right? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that's supposed to draw people. Okay? So they lost the vision, right? Secondly, they lost their spiritual vitality. Look at chapter 1, verse 9, we read several verses. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had, had drunk. Now even out of priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. Okay? So he's just sitting around. Doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that. Now go to chapter 3 and read verse 4. Uh, we actually ought to read 3 too. And there the lamp of God went out of the temple of the Lord. Another, another symbol. The lamp of God went out. Okay? It wasn't supposed to go out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here am I. Okay? He ran into Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. He said, I called you not. Go low down. Lay down. And he went and laid down. So, okay. Now you can say that he's just a little hard to catch on, but the vitality ought to show him that it was God speaking to Samuel at that particular time. Go over to verses 13 and 18 of this same chapter. No, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Well, let me see. You see the 4, 8, 13, 18? Let me see. Uh, 4, 4, 13. And when he came, when he came, lo, Eli sat up on a seat by the wayside, watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it all, the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What does this mean, the noise of this tumult? And the man came hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. 
He had lost the ability to be the person of God. He, he just wasn't sensitive anymore to what God was doing. Now, he didn't just tell Samuel to go lie down one time. He told him two or three times, go lay down. And then finally, he got the message. Hey, this is not, uh, you're not just hearing things. This is God speaking to Samuel, okay? You see, the difference here in what is going on is kind of the difference that you see in a world. Some people play the game to win, and some people play the game not to lose. Now, you and I both know that when you play the game not to lose, you usually end up losing, right? Happens all the time, happens to sports teams, and sometimes it happens to church. You see, the watchwords of today's comfortable congregation don't rock the boat. People come in full of vitality, new members, let's do this, let's do that. So, no, no, we can't do that. They don't speak up, they don't do anything, they just stay in the status quo because they're afraid of rocking the boat. Right? Now, you have to remember where Eli came, okay? You could say he was the last judge, but he didn't do any deliverance. He was a priest, okay? But what preceded Eli's reign or priesthood? Somebody tell me. What book? Judges. Judges. Okay. Now, what happened during the period of the judges? All 13. What the 13, Judy? <laughs> All 13 followed the same pattern in life. What was it? Okay. The people of God sinned. 13 times. God put them in captivity. 13 times. They cried out to God for mercy and deliverance 13 times, and God sent them to deliver. Okay? Time after time after time. It never varied. It never varied. Every judge, sin, captivity, cry out for, and, and deliverance. That was it all the time. Okay? You see, today it's very important for people of God to have a backbone. Stand up against sin. We talked at the Brotherhood last night of why God was taken out of the public schools. But friends, we have nobody to blame but our own self. When it happened, we let it happen. Christians could have done something about it, but we don't, we don't, we don't want to vote, we don't want to stand, we don't want to be counted. You see, there's folks today that are interested, more interested in comfortable living, getting rich, and they don't want it to cause any problem whatsoever in the hearts and lives of anything. Even if God gives them a vision, they don't have the vitality to carry it out because they won't stand firm for God. Okay? Let me give you an example. Okay? You'll know who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to call the name. The largest congregation in America okay, is pastored by a fellow who never rocks the boat. And he makes $40 million a year. Now, I could get my own half of that, you know. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, somebody had to like him to put him in that position. Friend, that's Christianity in America today. I don't care what you say. You just turn on the television and see. It's nothing about judgment. It's nothing about repentance. It's nothing about the trouble that's coming because of our sinfulness. We just, we just go along the status quo. Now, we might have a vision, but even if you have a vision, you've got to have the vitality to carry out that vision. Eli was an old man, and he was he's packing it in. You know, I'm 90 years old man. And so he just packed it in. That happens to churches. When people get to the place, they just pack it in, and they're not lively anymore. They're not willing to do something. You know, famous words, let somebody else do it, right? Well, the problem is, if God told you to do it, you're supposed to do it, right? Any comments on that? All right. Yes, sir. I agree. You agree? Amen. <laughs> you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to talk. Amen, preacher. <laughs> I, I was at his band Sunday morning. And listen, they have a good crowd. They have about as many people as we have. And you know, his band, that's a little church. 
And I had an amen crew right on the front pew, Larry Davis and Harry Monroe. And Harry, I don't know what happened when you got here, but you was amen and it is a man. <laughs> <laughs>
child, girded with a linen ephod, that was the garment of the priesthood. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the year to sacrifice. Now that's real sweet. Mom was looking at her after her son, making him a little coat. Neli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord gives thee seed of this woman for the law which is lent to the Lord. And they went into their own home. Now the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. How they lay with women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, do you see that picture? Do you understand what's going on? These were going to inherit the priesthood. But they were taking advantage of the women when they came to offer something to God right at the door of the house of God. Bad stuff. Now Eli was very old and heard why I would have read that. And he said unto them, Why do you do such things? I hear your evil dealings all by the people. In other words, you know, like we talked last week, gossip. Back then was just like gossip it is today. And he said unto them, Why do you such things? For I hear your evil dealings by all people. No, my son, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. That's the thing about it. When you're a leader, a spiritual leader, you cause other people to sin too. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father. Underline that. Daddy, we don't want to listen to anything you've got to say. We're going to live our own lives, do our own thing. What they didn't know in their lives was going to be short-lived because the Lord was slaving. The child Samuel grew on and was in favor with the Lord and also with me. Okay? So that's where we'll stop. So Hophni and Phineas, 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 I'm sorry. Hophni and Phineas, okay? Uh, they just did eat. They were supposed to inherit the priesthood. But the Lord is not going to allow the priesthood to be taken by them. He's going to guard it very, uh, very guardedly. He's going to protect it. And he's going to take their lives. And he's going to do that. Uh, so, long story short, i got to draw this to a close. Eli failed as a father. Somehow or another, he wasn't involved in their life like he should. Now, he rebuked them. But it doesn't tell us anything about any discipline in their life. We don't know a lot because all we have is these four chapters. Okay. Several weeks ago, I wrote an article. I didn't write it, but I was interviewed for an article that appeared in the Orangeburg paper about dads. Okay. Um, and I made a point, and you know what dads is? It's a pregnancy crisis center. And and Candace had already talked about the babies that had been saved and why it was created is because. The lady, Miss Faye Hill, down in Charleston, saw that the, the abortion rate in Orangeburg was highest than any in the state. And she was from Orangeburg, so she wanted to come and start a, 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 a crisis, pregnancy crisis center. And it's wonderful that babies have been saved. But the point I wanted to make is, listen, it's not just good enough to save the babies. Wonderful. But what happens to them now? And how the mama and the daddy, and the most important thing they did was have parody classes. Not only for the mama, but the daddy has to get involved in the raising of those children. Now, we all know that sometimes even God, the children that are brought up in the house of God, make bad choices and become ungodly children. But the point is this today. In the lives of a lot of children, and not necessarily out yonder in the world, but also in the churches, there are a lot of parents, or not a, not a lot of parents, but a lot of fathers who are AWOL. Now, how, why does that mean? And I say this with love, okay? Just think of the single parents that we have involved in our church. I'm not throwing rocks at them because they are in a situation they have to be mom and daddy. But brothers and sisters, God meant for children to have two parents. Like I said, I say that with love. I really do. But 
there's fathers who are AWOL, and there's children that after they're brought in this world and they're saved, then they become devil's children. And the Bible specifically says, I can't find it, it's here. I read it earlier today. I think it's chapter 2 somewhere that, that the children of Eli sinned and their father restraineth them not. Find that for me. We got Google or something. It's here. We got to read it. I didn't know. No, it says those particular words. got to see that verse. Somebody Google it. Uh, 1 Samuel 3.13. 3.13. Thank you, sir. Thank God for Google. <laughs> Verse 13, I had it marked. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever. Now that's God speaking to Eli for the iniquities which he knows. Because his sons made themselves vile. We read just a minute ago, how about? Okay? And he restrained them not. So, in other words, there wasn't any discipline in Father did not visit his children and look what they became. So I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it's important to have both parents. And it's also important for the parents not to go against one another. And I say this in love too, but I have stood across people who was having problems with the children. And the daddy would sit there and say, you know, my wife won't let me discipline our children. Now, that, that's, that's a little big question, isn't it? Or the daddy would, or the mama said no, said he wants to discipline him, and the mama won't let him. I've also seen where the daddy would, and, and this, I'm, I'm telling you, actors, nobody in this church, this is years ago, but where they come scantily dressed, two, two daughters came scantily dressed, and the, and the daddy said, you're not going out there with those kind of outfits on, go change. And the mama slipped them out the back door. Parenting is the most important job that anybody will ever have. Okay? And like I said, I say it with love. But the mama has to be involved and the daddy has to be involved too. Listen, listen. I know divorce is part of our world. We understand that, right? But just because we divorce, when I do divorce counseling, I said, now listen, you may not have a relationship with that woman anymore, but you will always be the parent of those children. That ain't going to change, and it cannot change, but I promise you, a lot of times when parents divorce their children, I mean, I'm sorry, parents divorce their spouse, they also divorce the children, and that is a crime and it's a shame, and that was the point I was making in the, uh, in the article. It takes the mom and the daddy, and parenting is the most important thing. Wonderful to save a life, but you also have to deal with that life that they're growing up. And Eli didn't do that. Eli did not do that. He failed his children. Okay? I got to draw this to a close. Okay? Uh, his sons were uh, unregenerate. It says, we read a while ago, they weren't saved. Okay? They were children of Satan, children of Belial. That was the name of the devil. And what they were doing, you know, uh, having relationships in the house of God uh, uh, with unmarried women, that was a sin. He, they were not restrained. We just read that in verse 13. His mom and daddy did not, did not, uh, uh, or his daddy rather, did not uh, 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 punish them or discipline them. And then they were unrepentant. They said, okay, God, that's fine. We don't want the priesthood. But what happened is they were both killed by the hand of God. And when Eli heard the news, he was sitting on the stump that broke his sons had been killed. I think he was in a battle. Then he fell on the back and broke his neck. And that was the end of Eli, his two boys, and his priesthood, and his inheritance. I mean, they were gone. The family was gone. But it was a tragedy. It was such a tragedy that it could have been avoided 
if he'd have answered the call a little bit better. So, you know, an ounce of provision is worth a pound of cure. That's an old saying, it ain't in the Bible, but it goes a long way. Anybody have any comments? Samuel was that, wasn't he? Huh? Was, was Samuel Eli's son? No, no, Sam, uh, Samuel was Hannah's son. Hannah and Elkanah. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the doctors that hung there, one of the baby doctors, I was in there one day, and I took a trip, and he said, yeah, and his mom and his other day, and she said, I don't know what to do with this child, but we know he's got two. You will not stay in the place. He said, now you tell me how is he supposed to get out of the place? He'd scream and holler when she come and take him out. And I said, he said, she's not disciplined in the child. So that. A funny story about that. When I was in Clinton, pastor in church, we had the evangelist at my church that was uh, staying with us. And we wouldn't take Jared out when he'd cry. He'd be in the crib crying, but he was going to go sleep in the crib. And the preacher got up in the middle of the night and said, I ain't listening to this. And he rocked Jared to sleep every night. <laughs> but anyway, huh? What, what? Look at 1 Samuel 4 16 and tell me what's going on there. 1 Samuel 4 16. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done? What is there done, my son? 1 Samuel chapter 4, chapter 3, verse 16. 16. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, Here am I.